Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti. Today I have the pleasure to be discussing with you facial bones of the skull. And I'm glad you're you're here to join in in this discussion, which I think is rather important. And you know, when I was preparing for this presentation, I bumped into uh, a couple of things that I thought were kind of curious that I wanted to begin our discussion. And that is when paleoanthropologists sort of discover uh, remains of fossils of especially human origin fossils like for example they find the skull of homo habilis right here and this was discovered quite a while ago like in the 1960s homo hal halibus is uh, in sort of um, common terms handyman but a lot of uh, scientists are able to study this this was discovered in tanzania i believe in uh, in the the species may have lived in East and Southern Africa and uh, back a few million years ago. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that those scientists study facial bones of the skull. In, in other words, they look at um, how teeth are embedded into the ma uh, maxilla. They look at uh, some of the orbits and they look at the, the overall cranium size in order to uh, evaluate brain development. And so, I find it very curious that we can learn so much about skulls and bones and we can know uh, uh, we can know things and sort of piece together mysteries of the past and today we're still studying facial bones and that's what this video is all about. So the skull as you may or may not know is composed of uh, eight cranial bones okay but today's conversation is going to be about the facial bones in particular. Okay, and there and there's 14 facial bones, and so let's just start that discussion off right out of the gate with the maxilla, right over here. And you and the maxilla can be considered to be one bone. It's sort of the the upper jaw right in here, uh, but it, it's the truth is it's really two bones that are fused together right here in the middle. You have your your left and right maxilla, and as you might anticipate, they support the upper teeth of uh, of the face and also they form right here the inferior orbital rim right in here of the of the eye socket or orbital we're gonna find in this conversation today that there's several bones that contribute to the uh, the orbital and the maxilla is one of them it also forms the upper jaw and as I was mentioning before but the hard palate right over here this is an inferior view looking up at the teeth as you can see here, here's the palatine process of the maxilla, as what this is referred to. And as you can see, here's a suture connecting the two sides of the maxilla. And then there is a fossa right here known as the incisive fossa. Uh, these are your incisor teeth right over here. These are your canines. There's four incisors, canines, then bicuspids or two of them, and then molars that are right over here. But here is the hard palate. So the Maxilla forms the hard palate, or at least the anterior portion of the hard palate. Here's a picture of the left uh, maxilla right over here. You can see it forms the upper jaw and a part of the inferior uh, region of the orbital. Uh, the function of the maxilla uh, continuing, uh, it's, it it's also forms the lateral, meaning to the side, the lateral margins of the nasal external nares right in here. You can see over on this side and over on this side. So the lateral margins. The maxilla also has the largest of all the paranasal sinuses. Uh, as you, you might be able to tell, uh, I'm fighting off a little bit of a, a, a flu cold right now. My, <laughs> I think my voice sounds a little bit more uh, congested than normal. Uh, and so perhaps my uh, maxillary sinuses are uh, congested with a little uh, mucus. And so you can see them right over here. So the maxilla contains these two uh, pockets right there, which uh, again, not only lower the, the overall weight of the skull, but they form uh, uh, an area in which um, air is warmed and humidified and cleansed. And so, uh, the, some of these markings of the maxilla that the orbit protects the eye uh, the orbital rim, rim does and as you can see right over here this inferior toward the bottom maxillary orbital surface 
is, is there. And then these are some of the other bones that we're going to be visiting uh, momentarily. So some other markings of the maxilla is this anterior toward the front nasal spine right in here. And, and as you might imagine, you'll notice that, you know, the what you normally think of as the nose is that uh, is mainly cartilage. And so this this uh, spine right here is attaching to the cartilage uh, of the anterior nasal septum right in here. And you can see it here and here. So that's the spine of the uh, maxilla. And again, you can see it right over here as well. Now, you also have these uh, alveolar processes right over here in which um, th they support the upper teeth in the jaw, as you can see right in here. Um, again, looking from the side, you can see here is the palatine process of, of the maxilla. It, it forms the hard palate or the roof of the mouth right in, over here. And you can also see it over here in green. Uh, palatine process, uh, hard palate, part of the maxillary uh, bone. And again, I mentioned this, that the maxillary sinuses are located in the maxillary bone and they help to lighten the bone in general. Uh, we also have some additional markings, the uh, nasal lacrimal gland, which is located right over here. Now, this particular bone right here is the lacrimal bone but this canal right over here is where the uh, well the lacrimal gland is a is a produces your tears and so this is the tear duct right in here it it allows the the nasal lacrimal duct from the from this gland to actually travel through this canal in, into the nasal cavity and so that's where tears are are able to to pass through in that area now we have some foramen of the maxilla as well and foramen again are, are holes and so some of the most <clears throat> common for, foramen of the skull is is the maxilla uh, infra meaning below infra orbital foramen right over here right below the eye sockets and so if damage you now you know what, what's traveling there blood vessels and nerves but if there's damage to this area um, for example there you receive some trauma to to, to this area that's often associated with a shiner or, or a black eye. But these infraorbital foramen uh, allow for nerves and blood vessels to pass through them. And as you can see it here and here located in purple. Okay. Uh, this is a nice shot also. Uh, this is looking uh, at the right uh, sort of lateral view of the right max maxilla you can see right here there's an opening allowing blood vessels and nerves to pass through right over in this area okay and i mentioned uh before uh that this low this inferior area right here of the maxilla was forming uh, part of the orbital but notice right over here do you see this inferior orbital fissure so in other words there's an opening right over here uh, that's sort of a, a foramen uh, of the maxilla, technically. And so what it's doing, it's allowing for cranial nerves and some blood vessels to be able to pass through in that, in that area right there. So the big fissure. It's an obvious thing to see in the skull. And so collectively, you have, you know, here's your fissure, um, and then here's that infraorbital foramen uh, down below right there. And you can see how the maxilla forms the, uh, the inferior uh, portion of, of, of the eye. So let's move on to the second facial bone, which is the palatine bone or palatine bones. They produce what is, if this is the anterior part of the hard palate, this is the posterior part of the hard palate. And so uh, you can see them uh, over here, highlighted in green. Uh, here again, uh, the posterior part of the hard palate is the palatine bones. What's interesting about these palatine bones is, I don't know if you were able to get a sense of it just by looking at this, but there's sort of a flat or horizontal area right here, but check this out. Um, that, what we're looking at is this horizontal plate, but really the bone, and there's two of them, the, really the bone is, if you will, if you were to isolate it, it's sort of l shape, capital l shape. I find that interesting. And then, you know, what we were looking at before that formed the, uh, the these are the palatine bones that, that formed the hard palate is, is this horizontal plate. 
but you have this perpendicular to the to, to the horizontal plate and then you have these orbital processes and so the orbital process if you could see it here in yellow is very interesting the palatine bone actually contributes there's a flat area right up here contributes to the orbital and so it contributes to the floors of the orbits which is kind of fascinating to me here here uh, this is a, a cool 3d look at so you can see it's kind of l-shaped horizontal plate here's the perpendicular plate and then here is the contribution to the orbit right over here that process the palatine bone then of course we have nasal bones and again <laughs> apologize for the for the nasal tone of my voice today but the function of the na nasal uh, bones are support the bridge of the nose okay so that you we have again two of them we have uh, the right and left okay if you're looking anatomically anatomical position this is the left side over on this side of the skull so they support the bridge of the nose um, they connect to the cartilage, maybe obviously, to the distal uh, part of the nasal uh, external nares. And so that's what their, their function is, is to attach to the cartilage and also to support the face. Nasal bones. Okay. Now, uh, this little bone right here is called the vomer. And the vomer uh, forms the interior, or I'm sorry, inferior, inferior portion of the bony nasal septum. So in other words, the lowest part of the nasal septum is being contributed by the vulmer. And as you can see right over here, it's the most inferior, okay? This perpendicular plate, if you watch the video on uh, bones of the skull, you'll notice, uh, or the cranium, you'll notice that this is... Uh, bone is the perpendicular plate of the ephemoid bone, but the vomer is con contributing to the inferior part of the nasal septum. Okay, So that's what that is right over there, the inferior portion of the nasal septum. Moving along through the facial bones, we have inferior nasal conche, and the function of these uh, bones are to uh, increase the, the uh, epithelial surface area in other words, the tissue that the mucous membrane that surrounds uh, this bone uh, uh, is able to therefore further increase the warmth and humidify the inhaled air by secreting uh, mucus. And there's also it's ciliated, which uh, provides a cleansing mechanism for incoming air. So this is the inferior, meaning lower nasal concha. Okay. The functions of this all in addition to what I was mentioning in terms of warming and, and humidifying and cleaning the air, it also creates sort of turbulence, uh, which then cr creates greater circulation, which achieves that functionality, which is cleansing and warming and uh, humidifying the air. So it creates air turbulence in the nasal cavity. I find that to be kind of interesting. Now, uh, another uh, very important facial bone is your cheekbone right here. And your, your cheekbone you have two of them again this is the the left uh, zygomatic bone as it's referred zygomatic bone and you have one over on the right side as well and this contributes uh, to the orbit as well and it contributes to the lateral wall do you see right there the lateral wall and rim of the orbit so the rim of the orbit and the lateral meaning to the side that's what lateral is meaning so this is your zygomatic bone right over here you can see in purple, we have two, you know, this is looking front on. This is your zygomatic bone and your zygomatic bone. Okay. And one of the uh, more interesting aspects of this is that it forms part of the zygomatic arch. And let me show you another picture of that so you can see. So the zygomatic arch is this archway right over here that connects the zygomatic bone to the temporal bone. And so what we like to call part of the zygomatic arch is we like to say that there's a temporal process of the the temporal process of the zygomatic bone articulates with in other words joins with in a joint right over here it meets up with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone so together it makes a zygomatic arch i hope that was clear so this is the let me repeat it if it just in case so here's the temporal bone right over here and here's the process 
right over here. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is the zygomatic bone right here, and this is the temporal process. Collectively, it makes a zygomatic arch. Okay, so there's passageway that, that can occur right in here for muscles. So uh, in addition to that, the zygomatic bone has uh, some important uh, foramina or foramen, and one of them is the zygomatic zygomaticofacial foramen. How about that for a <laughs> for a long word? Uh, and that's located uh, right over here, as you can see, in the zygomatic bone. There's a little there's a little opening right over there, and that's for sensory nerves of the cheek. As again, that makes sense because it's is your cheekbone. Okay. <coughs> the next bone along our discussion of facial facial bones is the lacrimal bone. And this one's tall. I mean, and this one's very small, I meant to say. And it's sitting over here, and it also contributes to the medial, in other words, towards the middle part of your orbit, okay? And in, in this lacrimal bone, uh, this is where your lacrimal gland or your tear glands uh, will be uh, resting, okay? And you can see it right over here, your lacrimal bone. Now, what's fascinating, I believe, about the lacrimal bone is that there's a little depression right in there, or sulcus. It's a little sulking right there. It's a little depressed. And this is the loca location of the lacrimal gland. And so there's like a little lacrimal sac right there. And it also leads, you know, collectively, I mentioned this when we were talking about the zygomatic bone, but it leads to the, the nasal lacrimal gland, which then connects to the, the nasal cavity right in here. And so that's where that canal is, is happening. All right. Here's another picture of the lacrimal bone right over here. You can notice that, there, that it's slightly in, indented right there, which is making up your lacrimal sulcus right in there. And then you can see the canal right over here in this area, lacrimal bones. Now mandible or jawbone, that's right, your jawbone forms the lower part of your jaw, which then again houses the lower teeth. Uh, now let's talk a, about a few of the markings of the of the mandible. There's there's a few to, that are worthy of mentioning. Uh, the body of the mandible is sort of the horizontal plate or portion of the mandible. Okay, so this is the body right over here, and then we have this artic uh, alveolar process, which is right over here, which supports the lower teeth. Okay, right over here, alveolar process. This is a a interesting medial view, meaning uh, towards the middle of the right mandible. Okay, so this is looking from the inside of the right mandible. And you can see here's the alveolar process. Uh, you also have this uh, protuberance. In other words, this sort of out, outflow right over here, this sort of bump right here. It's the mental protuberance right over here in, in your uh, mandible. You can kind of feel it right up here in the front, protuberance. And that's an attachment point. You're like, what's the point of that? It's an attachment point for some of the facial muscles. Okay. And now you also have a, a, a depression on the medial surface. Again, this is now inside. Uh, for uh, In this depression right in here is for your, if you can see it right over here, there's like a dim depression. And that's for the submandibular salivary gland. You may know that, or not, but you, there's three salivary glands. There's a submandibular, in other words, below the, the jawbone or sub or submandible. There's a sublingual below your tongue and a parotid one, which is over here uh, below your below your ear. Okay, but so there's a depression right there that sits the, the salivary gland. This my mylohoid line is, as you can see right over here is an insertion for the mylohoid muscle, which is uh, controlling the floor of the mouth. Okay, so there's a little line right there for muscle attach attachment. It's an insertion point. Okay, and then ramus is the ascending part. Ramus is, is a word meaning branch. So it's its branching part right over here of the, of the mandible, and it forms the mandibular angle on either side. So over on this side is the ramus, and on this side is the ramus as well. Now you have these uh, 
condylar processes or, or condyles. Uh, you can see there's one located here and one located over here. Now, this particular uh, condyle process articulates, in other words, attaches to or meets up with the temporal bone. As you can see over here, this is the temporal bone of, of, the, of the cranium. And so it articulates in that area uh, and it forms the joint, which the two bones meet, called the temporal mandibular joint, right in here. Okay. Now, this coronoid process is the insertion point for temporalis bones that help to close the jaw, and that's the function of it. Okay. So that muscle is very strong right, in, in that area. So that's its function, is, is uh, an insertion point for muscles to close the jaw. Mandibular notch is this sort of arched area right here on both sides of the mandible, okay, that support uh, both the ramus and, and the, uh, the condyle right over, over here, or cor coronoid process right over here. And so this is your mandibular notch. It's very obvious when you're looking at the mandible. You also have some foramen, uh, mental uh, foramen, foramia, for plural or for ramen singular you can see there's a hole right here and again these are sensory allow for nerves sensory neurons of the lips and chin to be able to pass through the the uh, mandible bone all right and you can also see uh, in this medial uh, take a look right over here you can see the mandibular foramen which is the, an entrance to uh, a mandibular canal. And this is for blood vessels and nerves of the lower teeth. And so this is often an area where a dentist might be able to give some Novocaine in an area uh, in order to do some work uh, in, in a patient's lower teeth, for example. Mandib mandibular foramen, okay? And then there's the hyoid bone. And so the hyoid bone uh, sits Below the face, it's sort of uh, suspended, if you will, but although it's attached by ligaments, uh, and, and also it, it attaches muscles, uh, it attaches to the larynx or voice box, the, your, to your pharynx or your throat, and also to the tongue. And it supports and protects the larynx. Okay, hyoid bone. And if you look at a close-up of the hyoid bone and you, and you sort of look at this yellow region right here, this flat area, this is known as the body of the hyoid bone. Okay, and then again, this is a point in which muscles attach to the larynx, tongue, and pharynx. And then you have, if you've noticed it from the, you have some horns. You have two big horns or the greater horns, and then you have lesser horns coming off to the side. Okay, let me come back to that. So here's your lesser horns and your greater horns over here. Okay, and so they also support the larynx and also attach uh, muscles uh, of the tongue. And as you can see right over here, uh, it's sitting right above the larynx and here's your trachea below. And this is the location of your hyoid bone. This is an anterior view of the hyoid bone. So you're sort of looking at it frontal, okay? Lesser horns. Uh, uh, attached to uh, stylohoid ligaments, how's that, uh, which support the hyloid and larynx itself. So ligaments are holding on, okay? And so that concludes our discussion of facial bones of the skull. I hope you found that enjoyable and that you learned a few things. Thanks for watching.